kind of have all this stuff here. Thank you. Good evening. This is the study session for Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education, and we are now in session. And we have school site presentations from Gilroy High School and also Christopher High. Who's going first? Who got the short straw? All right. The tallest guy got the shortest straw. Okay. Mr. Jeremy Dirks, principal. Christopher High. Christopher High School, thank you. Principal of Christopher High School. I'll get it right, Jeremy. Well, good evening, uh, Board of President Paceno, Vice President Pace, Board members, and Dr. Flores. I'd like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to present our school plan for Christopher High School. And just a little caveat, I, I'm not wearing a long sleeve shirt in that time because I've got the door and I've so I don't want to pull that <laughs> Principal Dirks, is your mic on? I believe it is now. That's yeah. Kate. <laughs> All right. So this is our beautiful school. Uh, still going strong after about 12 years now. I, I will read our mission statement. I know you've read it, but I think it's key to hear. Um, Christopher High School is a comprehensive high school whose mission is to educate all students to be academically proficient, innovative thinkers, innovative thinkers. Our positive environment prepares all students for a challenging future by encouraging them to succeed in their pursuit of excellence. We strive to facilitate academic and social growth, along with civil and social responsibility through engaging curricular, curriculum and extracurricular activities. All right. Our vision statement is expecting all students to use their hearts and minds well. This was uh, created by our, and I believe it's a quote, and it was by our founding members of our, of our school. Student learning outcomes, I'm not going to read every slide for you. You've read these. If you have any questions about them, you're more than willing, uh, welcome to ask us about them. Stakeholder input, I think this is key because some of the things we did to get input on our, our SIPSA, our school plan for student achievement. Uh, student surveys go out year round for uh, school wide, specifically for the SIPSA, but also for different programs that we run. We actually got our list today of our surveys for throughout the year so that we can plan accordingly. Uh, SIPSA and WASP goals are shared during staff meetings. We review almost all of our staff meetings are based upon one of our goals accordingly. Last year was a WASP year, a uh, mid-year review. Staff surveys were administered every quarter. Parent survey twice through Google Form and Parent Square. ELAC and Parent Club presentations were prepared and done over Zoom meeting last, last year. Uh, subgroup data, there's no significant change in our data. Um, we're, we're a pretty big school, you know, um, and we're, we're excited about that. Um, our, same with our, our other subgroups. No significant change from um, previous years. CASP data. Um, we stay pretty steady. Our old data that we um, would compare it to is about three years old, so I don't think that's fair. As you can see, we about... Um, 60% met or exceeded standards in our ELA. And in math, it was about, um, 20, I'm doing math on this, 30%. So um, while we could always have room for growth, we stayed about, we were pretty stagnant from we were, where we were before uh, COVID hit. We don't have scores from the, uh, during our COVID years. Uh, CAS, so these are our scores from 21, 22. This was our, only our second year where it actually counted. We piloted it in years past. Our first pilot year was right before COVID. We actually have a significant uptick and we think it was because this was the second year that it was actually a, a thing for our schools. So we're excited about that, but hopefully it, it stays strong and we'll be monitoring that. Jeremy, can you tell them what CAST stands for? Yeah, so it's our, Cal the actual acronym I'm bad at, but yeah. it's our science test administers to our juniors. Basically it's a part of the CAST testing. It's our, our um, achievement scores. And to preface this and for our community, uh, our juniors in high school are the only ones tested for that. And Jeremy, could you yeah. um, just discuss, because it is being streamed to the public, yeah, what course. CASP is and also ELA? Yeah, CASP um, is our, I always forget this acronym, but they are our achievement scores, basically. Basic and ELA is our English language, um, give me the last one, art and arts, uh, language arts test. Um, basically, it's there to just see how we're doing. Um, see how we're doing in, in English and writing and, and that stuff. And then same with math. And then this is our science test. So um, 
they all kind of, it's a cumulative test for your, your four years in high school. And so it really, it's a measurement stick. It's a little tough for our, us high school because we only do our all high schools across the state because we only do juniors. Um, it's not comparing apples to apples every year. It's really apples to oranges, but it is a measuring stick that we use. So Kermit, since you're probably the only one in the room that can say what CAS oh, is, would you say that out loud? No, I could do it. I could do it. Good. I could do it. Wow. Go for it. Go for it, yeah. <clears throat> the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress. Oh, that Good. Works. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> LPAC Summative 21-22, um, relatively stagnant. As and you see, LPAC is? It was English language proficiency, and I always get the AC assessment, assessment of California. <laughs> assessment. Um, basically, it's measuring our students' um, English levels. And so our students, this is pretty normal for most folks, our freshmen and sophomores, they're relatively young, they haven't had, um, they're still learning, grasping the knowledge. And as they get better, um, they go on, move on to three and four. And then after the four, they actually uh, reclass and they're out of that program. Um, a lot of times, statistically, not just at our high school, most high schools throughout the state, unfortunately or fortunately, um, our students get to about three, the level three in, in the green here, and they usually stagnant. Um, we have some um, programs for that, which we'll talk about in, in later slides, but that is a phenomenon across, across California. <laughs> and we kind of mirror that. Goal one, LCAP goals provide high quality instruction, 21st century learning opportunities to ensure career, college and career readiness. I'm not gonna read out all the goals, but you see how they do match up to our WASC and our uh, site goals as well. LCAP site and WASC goals. So our goal one, the first one is just to improve the caliber of professional learning communities. That's something we're really taking to heart here at Christopher High School. Uh, we've been doing that for the last four years that I've been there. Eric Kawada, one of our assistant principals at Julie Bergen, were instrumental in, in starting that. And Kay Gunther, who's come aboard, has really uh, taken the ball and run with that as well. So that's to improve our cycle of inquiry, build capacity and staff with training, use the um, professional learning community process to review data and just instructional strategies and actually our district is doing that now as well, uh, district-wide among our amongst our cohorts. So long story short, what that really means is just we're looking at problems, we're looking at through data, we're not just guessing what we wanna do, we're being data-driven in, in what we do. So we're, we're embracing that. We've sent some uh, uh, teachers, I think about 20 now, we're gonna re kind of implement that program where we send them to Solution Tree, which is the uh, kind of the gold standard for professional learning community. Uh, seminars across the California and the United States, and we're going to start sending more of those folks to that. We're excited about that as well. Our big thing is we're continuing, continuing to examine our bell schedule. Really, as we know, I've presented this to the board before, we, especially our teachers and ourselves, we want intervention within the school day. And how does that look? And so we, we've done some PLC modeling through that and looking at the different models. So our leadership team is looking at bell schedules to meet our needs. We're in, we, we just begun to involve Gilroy High School in the planning for this, and we're looking for examining ways to build into schedule intervention time for students that are struggling with A through G requirements. So many times students fall behind, and we tell them to come after school. Well, that's great if you don't have a job or if you're uh, if you're have some social capital, but if you don't, those students are usually lost lost in that process. So we're trying to implement that during the day. It's not the easiest thing. There's a lot of, lot of um, hurdles, but we're working on it, and I think we have a good model, and I think we'll get get there when the time comes. Um, continue to use use of observational tool to measure classroom practices. We go into our classrooms. Uh, when we're walking through, we don't just go in and sit, smile and wave. We've done that before, especially coming back from COVID, but we want to re-implement this walking, uh, this observational tool where we, the teacher's getting feedback. It's not necessarily for us. It's more for the teacher so they can see what strategies am I using, what has not has, what is happening, what's not happening. Um, so we refine our learning walking tool, not just by us. We bring it into leadership and our department chairs actually look at it and what works for them and their department. So that's big for us. And then we're going to re-implement this. We didn't re coming back from COVID was very difficult for all these different processes. But this year we're releasing teachers to observe peer professional development. So long story short, we're either giving them substitutes for a period or they're using their prep period. They walk in with a colleague, they go into other classes and see what they're doing. Best practices and sometimes things that need improvement. So as a teacher, we're so, a lot of times we're in our classroom, it's our little fiefdom, but when we do get out to see other people, it really helps us uh, 
see what what is working and what's not. So that, we think that's key. Our leadership team asked for that. You know, I our team, while we're the administrators, we really use our experts, which are our teachers, to kind of help us tell what see what they want, and we try to help them get that for themselves. And that's that's all with all this. This PLC, we ask the teachers what they want. Is there data to prove that you need it? And let's go and let's get, let's get it for you. I, I believe that's our role as administrators to help them and support them. All right, one point, we're still on the same goal, college and career readiness, continue to move all students into California colleges. We actually have a program, California colleges, um, offer opportunities to explore secondary options. We use Rock the Mock that fell, up, uh, fell away for a little bit during, um, during COVID, but it's coming back. I believe it's November 7th and 8th. Um, Career days, guest speakers, we're going, coming back to bringing more guest speakers on. That is a thing. And so we're excited about that. You know, it's not just the colleges, which we do absolutely want our campus. We're working with career technical um, institutes and, and educational forums, I guess, uh, guest speakers, any, anyone we can get on that's going to help our students succeed after high school. Um, continued use of technology. I think our whole district, but I know Christopher, we're continuing, continuing training and use of Google Apps for Education. That was difficult to get to when COVID started, but that was a, a great leap ahead for all of our teachers and our staff and our students. So all of our students at our school have Chromebooks one-to-one. -one. Um, that was a great initiative by our district. We were getting close, but it really put us over the top. And um, students continue to use those Chromebooks and online tools. And, and I'm sure you're all aware of our um, view boards. We're using those, they're giant iPads and our teachers are using those all day, every day and it's great. All right, goal number two, <clears throat> provide equitable support for all learners, create support structures for all statistically significant subgroups in order to achieve parity and academic learning. All right, we're ex I mean, our subconscious bias, that's us. Like, um, um, so long story short, we're using our PLC process amongst ourselves. We examine discipline data by subgroups I, we don't just go on a whim, ah, Kay, Kay did this, so we're gonna give her four days. But that ah, Julie, she's pretty cool. We like her, we're gonna give her two days. And so we really try to make sure everything's the same. We're, uh, I don't necessarily have it on there, but we're really looking at alternatives to suspensions. Uh, Suite 360 is something that we piloted at our school last year. So if it's non-violent violent issue, it's not, uh, I've forgotten the word, but it's not something hurting others. Uh, we have a lot of different um, learning opportunities for the students to kind of self-reflect and, and check it out and basically hopefully not do those behaviors again. Um, support during the school day. Analyze <clears throat> post-mastery um, pilot survey data. This is going back to that, um, looking at intervention, stuff that we can do during the day, develop a schedule with appropriate intervention supports and collaborate with appropriate stakeholders for decision-making and approval process. That is you, the school board, that is a uh, cabinet and making sure that we're not just rushing it, which we may have done in the past. Um, continue support for, of the EL population. Continue to monitor our ELs and support struggling students. Refine our EL pathway to support the subgroup to achieve. Train our teachers on EL strategies. Um, Ms. Diaz is great at that right now. She, she's our new uh, instructional specialist. She's sending out little tidbits and uh, different tricks and she's all, not tricks, different uh, strategies. And also uh, she's presenting to our uh, staff throughout the year. And monitor completion and graduation rates of our EL students. Looking at data and what can we do better? All right, create school interventions uh, school-wide. Determine deficiencies of our students in math. That's real, you saw it on our scores. So what are we doing? We've been talking about that for a long time. We get, we're gonna keep talking about it until it gets better. Um, examine across curricular support for math at our school. We're working that with our leadership TNC and how can we talk about math in other classes just besides our math class? And hopefully that, that kind of gets into them and it just becomes part of our, their day. Use of Mathia data to examine deficiencies and target specific growth areas. It's an app we have. We're not using it with Fidelity yet, but we're really pushing it. Um, and it's like a Khan Academy has data. It's, it's like a tutoring almost practice. Um, we're gonna refine the walkthrough tool, which I'm not gonna talk about again, but because I already kind of went into that. And same thing, create interventions during the school day. They all match up um, a little bit more in depth, but we're definitely looking for interventions during our school day. Goal three, school culture and engagement, something that I pride myself on. I think all of our schools in our district do. 
to build an inclusive school community that focuses on the whole student through communication support and involvement. Communication tools to best reach out to our stakeholders. Um, we want to build our school climate culture by celebrating the Cougar Way. I really want to toot our horn for our uh, APs, our Culture and Climate Committee also, that we created this uh, week of welcome, which is uh, basically we use the first three days of school. We kind of reteach our expectations. We reteach teach the Cougar Way. And we also have a little, um, it's like a carnival atmosphere almost, but it's a, a connections fair we call. We bring in all our people we have MOUs with and different people in the community that are resources for us. Resource fair would be very good, another term for it too resources in the community that they can use um, and they, they have access to. So we bring them right on campus along with the fun and they can reach out and it's pretty cool. Uh, we're always looking at ways of communicating with our folks, our parents. Um, this parent square is working pretty well right now. Examine how students understanding of racial bias and socioeconomic factors impact student life. We provide opportunities for students to engage in discussions of social justice. We have, oh, upwards of 40 clubs. Uh, they were looking into that. Leadership, our, um, our, I call it our student council, our student representatives from each class. Um, they, they, they look at these things and their leadership class, they look at this, um, not necessarily always in a formal way, but just a discussion and, and looking at ways we, we come together and examine equity and cultural proficiency in our schools. C uh, promotes participation in school activities. We're lucky here at Gilroy, both of our high schools have a robust athletics, extracurricular programs. And um, we do that. So we're excited about that. Uh, we find the MTSS process. That is one that is school-wide and supports all our students. We have students struggling right now with mental health and this definitely helps with that. And it's a, it's a process you're referred, who can help you best. And we kind of triage and work that out. And I was a little bit over, but there's my presentation. And I'm definitely opened up to any questions. I have my assistant principals that can help me with all those great ac ac acronyms. And I have Deb over here too. So anything you... Want to ask? I'm an open book. Trustees, questions. Trent. Um, so, um, one of your first slides. Uh -huh. Mike, is your mic on? Um, for the homeless population mm -hmm. that you have, um, how are you identifying that they are homeless and do we offer any other services outside of the education? Yeah, for the most part, they're identified through Lisa Lorona here at the district office um, and that comes to us. It's, it's pretty confidential confidential information. And then she makes sure we're given the services. Sometimes it's extra meeting with our, um, with our counseling staff. Sometimes it's through the MTSS process. It used to be, but because of free lunch, um, we all have it. It used to be making sure they have that. Do they need an extra backpack? And so our counselors are kind of the triage for that. And it usually comes from uh, top down. However, we do have forms that if someone is going through that process, they can fill that out and go forward too. And Deb's gonna give a little bit more information. Yeah. And Ms. Lorena also meets with all of the families because families do have to qualify for McKinney Vento. And then with that, um, through our district, they are eligible for additional services. So we connect them with many of our agencies for housing. Um, we do have um, transportation tokens for them so that they can get transportation where they need. Also, um, we um, help them with food banks and getting what they need there as well. Um, we've also... Um, often worked with our local um, stores such as Old Navy and Target to get um, vouchers for clothing as well for our students. Perfect, thank you. And uh, I, th I think it's implied, but our SLS coordinators do a great job uh, kind of with all subgroups helping that. And it doesn't even have to be a subgroup, it can just be the big group. Uh, they'll, they'll help with uh, and facilitate that. Cool. And then one other yeah. question, sorry. Yeah. Um, for your goal 2.1, um, mm -hmm the analyzing the discipline data, uh -huh. would it be possible to provide that report that your, your staff are analyzing to the board? Yeah, Aries uh, does a great job of that. It's just a couple clicks. That's not a problem at all. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. And I would like to piggyback on that. Um, several, three of us, um, trustees have attended restorative justice mm -hmm. training. Have How is that um, being implemented at your school or is it? Yeah, so with Fidelity, no, I would, it is not being done with Fidelity at our school. However, we do do the Suite 360 where we're looking at alternative ways of suspension. Um, I have done the training in my previous uh, assignment. I know Ms. Bergeron has as well. However, we are all going to uh, go to the new training. We were all busy at different times last year. I believe it's in October. In October. So we'll be uh, attending that four-day training as well. 
So is there a, a, a large group of you that's going because All you three need of a, Yes, and then we've already had actually admin. our uh, a few classified staff attend as well. Okay. So our process has been started and we're gonna continue it. It sounds like we have more from the district level too. No, that's good. And <clears throat> as a reminder for the board, as part of our process, we had the trainings from the spring, summer, and October to make sure 100% of our admin staff are trained. So as of October, 100% of the secondary admin will be trained in restorative practices. We've also been doing the trainer of trainers. We've had one full session of that. We're working on another. So then by the spring, we will be rolling it out to groups of staff members who also would like to be trained in restorative practices. Many schools, like with PBIS, have groups or committees that work on that. They will be trained, but they will be trained by our in-house trainers. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Trustee Nelson. Thanks. Um, three questions. Uh-oh. Um, what was the participation rate or what is typically the participation rate when you do parent surveys? Oh gosh, I'm gonna re uh, refer that to Kay. Yeah, it's right. Um, our participation rate is typically around somewhere between 40 to 60 percent, depending on what survey it is. What time of the year? Yeah, there's a lot of factors, but yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um. Second question. <laughs> You mentioned that you're going to ask um, people other than, you know, college educated, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of career to come to your college career readiness, you know, the rock the mock and so forth. What kinds of trades people have you invited in the past? Oh, gosh, to rock the mock. I mean, realtors, uh, nurses, uh, construction workers, construction owners for that. I mean, that's we probably culinary have Academy. culinary academy. I mean, this goes on for that one. That one rock the mock is really good. Now. Um, individual classrooms. Mr. Williams is a woodshop. He usually brings in people specific to his trade. Um, same with Mr. Carrick and his uh, design, digital design, computer science brings in folks as well. And while a lot of those are pretty high end goals, you don't necessarily have to have a degree for those. So, yes, we do. And the Rock the Mock is just amazing. We really um, have people from all walks of life in that one. Okay, well, now that I have the time, I'll come watch. Yeah. Well, come on and yeah. be a part of it. You can I did. be part of the interview. Be part of yeah. it. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah, I've yeah, done we'll it. I'll put you on the spot. Great. I'll send you an invite. What and I you said, had a third you question? More, I yes, I do. Okay. I'm just. Yes, you're my favorite teacher ever. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, 3.1, the communication tools. Mm -hmm. So you had a 40 to 60% participation rate with the parent survey. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you have here is create opportunities to eng engage parents and create alternative methods of communication. So that's still a work in progress. Do you have any ideas right now? Well, right now, I mean, Parent Square is our, our main one, but we're excited. Back to school night will be our first time in, gosh, three years. So our freshmen, sophomore, and juniors will be there. The parents will be their first time back on our campus officially. So we're super excited about that. Um, I envision us having, we've done this in the past, so I was, and I plan on having this again, parents able to sign up for Parent Square right there. Although most have signed up for Parent Square because of, of uh, COVID and us online learning. Yeah, we're around I, around 96% usage rate of Parent Square, which is extremely high. Okay, so we, good. Yeah. All right. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Mr. Diaz? No, and you were yes, one of my favorite Diaz. students, by the way. <laughs> yeah. What one of? One of. Trustee Diaz. Um, oh, yeah, but the question, the comment, I think it's more of a comment about yeah. the ELAC group and how the meetings, ELAC yeah. and DLAC, the meetings were held uh, remotely last year during COVID, yeah. um, if it increased participation rate, I was thinking that it is something that it doesn't have to be binary, doesn't either have to be held or not held because we're out of COVID protocols. So if it increases participatory rate, then it'd be a good thing to, to maintain. It's funny you said that because I talked to Ms. Garibay just yesterday and um, that's something we're, we're looking at. I mean, unfortunately we get very little turnout for that. Um, maybe, but during COVID we had around 15 compared to four, one, you know, and, I'm and serious. For uh, like athletic booster clubs and all the all those different events. I know we may do a hybrid, yes, yeah. uh, and so we might have yes, all yeah. those. The other ones are pretty; they're more highly attended. But this one, we, we are we've always been struggling. I think that's a phenomenon across the state. I know that was similar at San Benito High School, but yeah, we're working to it. Any other questions at all? I have one. Yeah, of course. On your goal three, it says examine equity and cultural proficiency. Can you expand on that a little bit for me? Yeah. Where are we at? 
Which one was it? I'm sorry. Bottom right under 3.2. Really just that's saying uh, how we're looking at equity. We're going to uh, circle up has been a group that's come and worked with us a lot. And so right now it's for our administrators and our uh, leadership team. However, we're pushing that back out. We're working on that with um, our leadership team a little bit. And we're also working that with the ASB, which I know Julie was going to speak to. Well, I also want to talk about we are... Um... We've done, gone through some trainings ourselves on um, examining equity in um, whether it's the class syllabus or um, how um, classrooms are arranged or um, discussions that are happening in classes. And we are working with our uh, leadership team right now, um, training them on examining equity and cultural bias in the classroom and hoping that that will um, be rolled out with their um, departments through department meetings as well. And the the term cultural proficiency kind of threw me. To be proficient in the culture it's is a new concept to me. <laughs> I think a lot of that comes also from um, looking at ways to make sure that we are um, aware of the, our cultures that are on our campus, whether they be um, identified cultures or non-identified cultures. And then and of course, and just be equitable as well amongst <laughs> all groups. They're, they're, they're nervous. Nervous. It's the, it's they're the nervous. proficiency that kind yes. of threw me. They're yeah. nervous. So part of what you approved last year was the OLAS training mm -hmm. that our secondary staff went through. Part of that is looking at what does cultural proficiency mean. Thank you. And what really that means. Should I is, take the training? <laughs> <laughs> so really in a nutshell is what it means is that there are some overarching things within different cultures that we can look at that may be different from um, our typical, what we would consider baseline culture in Gilroy, but then every student has their own subculture within that. So it's really about looking at each student individually and looking at our practices and saying, where are we um, within ourselves um, looking at using cultural bias, whether we notice it or not, right? When are we falling to that? How do we address that? How comfortable are we having those discussions at all with other staff members and with students about what our understanding might be of the culture, even the culture of a classroom, right? What is the culture? Each classroom has its own culture. What is it? Why is it? How is it established? And does it work for everybody that's within the room? So that's really what the training has been focused on and helping them to, again, like they said, that rollout, right? We do that trainer of trainers model in most of what we do so they can go back, work with their leadership teams. Their leadership teams have a better understanding and many have requested more training because it is quite an advanced concept, to be honest. I mean, it's one that we all struggle with and then they get more training and then they go back and we work with more teachers until eventually, right? It is embodied throughout the schools. Thank you. And, and uh, more on a layman's note for me, I struggle with that definition all the time. But what I really think we do well at Christopher High School, we can do, we're not great at it, but what I think we do well is our ASB, specifically Gretchen Yoder Schrock. We look at like we do or do our dress up for the holidays. You know, we, we are in traditional Christian white stuff. But however, but Dia de los Muertos, I'm forgetting. Uh, and, and Gretchen makes sure that we have other holidays that aren't just our holidays, if that makes sense. My holidays, anyway. We make sure we're having holidays from everyone and other um, groups and just making sure everyone's kind of represented. And Gretchen Yoderschrag does a great job of that. And I, I thank, thank her for keeping me on my toes. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, trustees? Thank you, Christopher. Hi, welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, we're going to take a two minute break <laughs> right now. So, what I will do is I will text one of you two comments because you guys can make eye contact with me. Why don't you keep me to one? So, um, and then you'll just say, hey, you got this message, so you can hold up your hands. He's got 15 minutes to talk. Show this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs>
um, at the end of the year. And I arranged uh, three days during the summer to meet with all of our department chairs, academic coordinators, our admin, to kind of look at our mission, look at our vision, uh, reevaluate where Gilroy High School was, um, what we were doing, how we survived last year, those kinds of things. Um, we rewrote the mission statement um, for the mission of Gilroy High School is to provide a safe, equitable, and inclusive environment that maximizes the level of student achievement by providing rigorous academic experiences and diverse opportunities that foster the growth of students into engaged community members. Um, we, we had something similar, but we wanted to be a little bit more um, direct about what we expect and what we want to do as a staff. I did check with uh, Dr. Winslow to make sure that it wasn't considered a run-on sentence, and he said we were okay. So thank you for that. The vision also, we kind of changed a little bit that we want every student to maximize their level of individual achievement. Now, individual achievement is not tied into, um, you know, kind of what we expect as a teacher, as an admin, but we want students to be able to maximize their performance and we wanna help them do that. If we help them do that, they will meet the state standards, they will um, do well, they will be successful, but we wanna make sure that we're looking at the individual, not just as a subgroup or, or anything like that. All those data points are important, but I think we want to delve deeper down into making sure that all of the students, you know, we know um, by name, by face, and that we're looking at their plans throughout the four years that they're with us and during the current year. We also want every student to be prepared for success in their chosen post-secondary pathway. Um, that could be a uh, four-year school, two-year college. Um, it could be the workforce could be vocational trade, anything that they want to do. We want to make sure that when they walk out of the gates of Gilroy High School, that they're ready to go, um, that they have an idea what they want to do and they have the tools to be successful. Um, and we also want every student to grow and mature into a productive and compassionate member of society. Um, we think the compassion part is extremely important um, for students to learn during the four years that they're with us and then uh, when they move out of Gilroy High School. So that is um, the purpose and in the introduction for this is we want to use strategic and targeted efforts and initiatives um, to provide rigorous instruction to prepare students or for endeavors, endeavors beyond high school and also develop and implement an equitable, inclusive and safe campus culture and climate. Um, that is one of our biggest priorities. Um, our subgroup data, much like uh, Mr. Dirks, uh, mentioned, we didn't see much in fluctuations. Um, you know, we're up in most subgroups except our African American population. Um, I, I can tell you that being out uh, this year so far, um, our subgroups are feeling good. Um, you know, our, our African American uh, students are involved in, in all aspects of our campus. Um, I'm really proud that we have actually three Pacific Islanders on campus this year. So um, that's always true to my heart, but um, our, our, the faces of our campus have not changed that much in the past year. Um, same with our subgroup data. <clears throat> um, it's pretty, it stayed pretty constant, a little drop in our ELs and our foster youth. So um, we're looking at that. Um, what I do wanna mention is the surprise that we've had this year is, um, you know, we were listening um, to all the predictions about uh, declining enrollment, but we are actually um, much bigger than we thought we would be. We're at about 1,778, um, give or take a few each day. But, you know, we were looking at 1,600, something like that. So um, I know that we've enrolled 107 new students when I checked a couple of weeks ago. So it's been a surprise, but you know, we like it. Um, we're not declining, so that's good. Um, the CASP is really one of our major concerns. Um, we did not do well, especially in math. As you can see, there's only 14% who were either met the standard or exceeded. And even with our English, it's only 36%. Um, there's many reasons, you can blame a lot of things, but basically we are taking a responsibility that we need to do a better job. Um, we've, we meet um, every week with our department chairs, our leadership group, um, and this is one of the focuses that we have 
when we'll be sharing the data with our staff at the staff meeting on Monday. But um, just this year, we've already been visiting classrooms, looking at what they're doing, making sure that um, what we are doing um, translates into more students meeting um, the standards for the CASP. And thankfully, Jeremy had to define the acronyms and I don't have to. Yeah. The science test, same thing, 24%. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do. Um, we have very capable students. Um, the students just need to understand, you know, how to get it done and, and the best practices for us. As a staff, we're looking at every aspect of instruction, of assessments and everything else so that we can make sure that in um, April, uh, when they take um, the, the CASP and the CAST, um, we will be more successful. Um, we did have to give the CAST to both seniors and juniors last year because our seniors had not taken the CAST as 11th graders because we didn't have it due to COVID. Um, our LPAC is, you know, it's pretty um, close to what Christopher High School is experiencing. Um, what I really do like about our LPAC and our uh, ELL and ELD is we have a task force that we have uh, Caitlin Matalora, Cynthia Gonzalez, and, um, and Adina De La Torre who are passionate about our EL learners. So we've set up um, our ELDs one and two in one classroom for instruction, our ELD threes in another classroom with uh, Ms. De La Torre. Cynthia Gonzalez teaches our ELD one and two. And when the ones and twos are ready for three, they can move right into uh, Ms. De La Torre's um, class because we put it in the same period. Um, of the day. So they're not having to rearrange their schedule or, you know, and encounter any of that. All they do is just go to a different classroom um, to get um, instruction if they, when they get to level three. And then our redesignation um, numbers have been pretty, pretty uh, successful the last couple of years. I can't tell you, but I went to the, uh, the ceremony last year and we had uh, many, many students um, we were able to reclassify. So goal one is to provide high quality instruction and maximize learning opportunities. Um, we really want to align our LCAP and SIPSA through weekly leadership meetings. We talk about it. We've already started talking about it and um, addressing some of the areas that we looked at, some of the goals shared with some of the goals, and then also working through our staff and department meetings, as well as our PLC. Uh, everything is centered around the SIPSA goals. Uh, the three that we're sharing with you tonight. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody's familiar and uh, working towards those. Our professional development is very targeted about our LCAP and SIPSA goals. Uh, we want to use a variety of internal and external presenters. Uh, we're having our EL task force work with our staff every month on um, strategies that they can use uh, for not only their ELD or their EL students, but you know students who might be falling behind or anything like that. Um, we will monitor student progress. Our academic coordinators have their alpha that they will um, meet with, um, go over their four-year plans. We've already done it with the seniors. Um, but we as a staff and we as an administration, we will also look at the, that information. We have our, um, our progress report grades next week. We'll take a look at that. So after every um, checkpoint or quarter semester grades, We'll run the report, we'll see what students are doing, and then we'll see what uh, strategies and supports we can put in place. Uh, we also want a discussion related to grading and assessments. This is one of, the, one of my big initiatives. Um, we want to look at how we grade. We want to look at how we assess students. Um, using a, a five-point rubric or an A through F um, works well in some uh, situations, but not so well in others. Um, one of the things that we've talked about and discussed is, you know, we have such a variety of students that when they leave us, you know, at 3.30, um, they all go to different types of resources and support at home. And using one grading system uh, for everybody, I, I don't think we can, I don't think we can do that. We're still discussing it. Um, we have, you know, staff who uh, buy into it, who haven't bought into it, and those in between. Um, I did purchase uh, grading for equity for all the staff and that. We're going to examine that book this year. 
<clears throat> we you also have to use our data like I showed you. I got the five minutes, so I have to speed up. Um, we have our SEL, SLS, and academic counseling. We're very blessed to have therapists on campus, our SLS coordinators, so that when we have students in crisis, we can address that. And even yesterday, we had to uh, address a student. So it's very nice to have them, very helpful for our students. Um, our observation tool, we're um, starting to do our, our learning walks. And like uh, Principal Dirk said, you know, we'll release teachers to either go with their department chair or with somebody in the department, or it could be a different department. We wanna see, we want our teachers to see others in the classroom. Uh, employee district can cite PLCs um, and util utilize instructional specialists. So uh, we wanna keep the coaching and support to the classroom teachers. Um, goal two is to provide equitable support for all learners. So again, we're gonna use a variety of methods and initiatives, professional development to focus on equity and access. So we want students to be able to access everything and be successful. Um, staff will provide targeted appropriate interventions for students. Um, we want them, when we get those progress reports or those grades, it's just not, all right, that's what you get. We want to look at the students. We want to do some case studies um, during our Monday meeting times so that we can provide some resources and some support. We have Credit Recovery, we have Envision Academy. Um, we also are working on tutoring, um, so we wanna use those. And we wanna reduce and eliminate barriers restricting access to curriculum and graduation. Um, and that's some of the things that I mentioned that you know when they go home, some of our students have to care for siblings or go to work or things like that. So we wanna make sure that they have an opportunity with us uh, to be successful. Um, we want to use data um, for best practices and then through our EL task force, dedicate PD time at staff meetings and PD days um, for our student or for our staff um, to better support English learner students. And as well as those who have been redesignated, because we still need to go back, check on them, uh, make sure that they're maintaining or improving um, their levels. Climate and culture engagement along with Christopher High School, very important. Um, we want to establish a cohesive, supportive, and safe climate on campus. I know Trustee Good, Dr. Flores was on our campus last year and witnessed some, some goings on that were really tough. It, it was a tough year last year. This year, I can tell you, and I'm knocking on wood because it's early, but it is a beautiful campus now. Our students are really doing a, a great job. Um, the second week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we met with every um, student on campus. Um, to convey our expectations, uh, tell them what we expect when they're eating lunch, picking up after themselves, getting participation in activities, visual and performing arts and things like that. So it's it's a 180 de degree difference this year. And we I, also, Greg, I just want to, I was going to say it at the end, but since you brought it up, uh, I visited with Linda and Michelle and we could see it, feel it, totally different climate this fall at Gilroy High than a year ago. Just amazing, okay. the progress. So we, I, speaking for myself, but I see the two of them shaking their heads. We left, they're feeling really good about this yeah. fall versus last fall at Gilroy yeah. High. It's going really well. I, I agree, and I, I do too. When I get there, I'm just so pleased and and we're out there always, and we're really, you know, the, the students are coming up, they're talking to us, interacting, just a very good vibe on campus. Uh, we really do. We I did not get our alumni tapped in last year, so that's one of our, our big things, um, and getting the parents. Surveys also. We did not do a good jo job on surveys, getting information. We did for our stakeholders, for our SIPSA, and, and talking to our ELAC and uh, school site council and things, but we need to put more surveys out um, continuously through the year to get some uh, feedback from our, our families. Um, student panels, where we each have a student panel that focuses on uh, mine is, or um, Mr. Brainer has climate, Ms. Karn has academics, and I have leadership. Um, so we meet with them every month just to get their feedback, um, things like that. We've had a lot of feedback on the dress code changes every day, so um, we'll continue that. Um, we really encourage participation from all students um, into uh, sports visual and performing arts, leadership, things like that. We have presentations for our EL students 
Uh, we're figuring out a way to do our announcements in Spanish so they feel included in, in the campus. Um, and it's going really well. We have students getting involved. Um, yeah, and we already talked about the presentations. Um, ASB leadership, we have a very collaborative approach through every possible way. And I really, if Mrs. Hack could stand up, please. Mrs. Hack is our, um, no, 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 you got to stand up, <laughs> is our um, ASB leadership teacher, um, activities director, and she is doing an exceptional job. Um, she has had so many um, activities in the first three weeks of school. And that's, I, I want to say that's one of the biggest reasons the vibe is so good. Um, and using her three classes of students to plan and execute everything um, has just, it's just been a wonderful year um, in our ASB activities and things like that. So um, very inclusive. We have uh, um, the Mexican Independence Day on September 16th that we're observing. Um, and we're throughout the year, like Mr. Dirk said, uh, we'll you know find other ways to celebrate everybody uh, on our campus. Restorative practices, we are using that. Um, he, uh, Mrs. Carr and Mr. Bright and I, we speak all the time. We look at ways of not to suspend or anything like that. Um, but we do want to have them understand um, the choice that they made was not um, the right one, and then move on from there. Um, recognition of students and staff, we're doing that right now. Um, and the communication, we're, we're doing well with the communication, but again, the surveys, we need to uh, do better. And we do have our uh, back to school night next week um, on Tuesday, so that parents will be able to meet with every department, every teacher, um, and we kind of have a global view of the campus. Sorry. Usually I don't talk that much. Trustees, any questions or comments? Twin. Trustee Fiak, sorry. No worries. Um, you mentioned that you had more students uh, than you expected. Do you happen to know where those students were coming from? I do not. I don't I think some of them are, I think a lot of them are moving into the area um, and enrolling at Gilroy High School, but um, uh, there hasn't been too many transfers or anything like that. They're just moving in uh, when they're registered. Um, you know, they just moved into our area. Trustee Nelson, is that a hand up? No? Okay. Trustee um, Nelson, I didn't have you as a teacher, but you're my favorite teacher too. Uh, <laughs> Just wanted to say. Um, I have a, I have a question. Um, I, I'm sorry, Jeremy set you up, but he talked about the percentage of parents that are signed up for Parent Square. Do you know what yours is? We're operating at about 94% right now. That's and then we will have the library set up um, at the back to school night for any parents who need still need to... Um, uh, register and get on. Awesome, both of you. Trustee Good, did I see your hand? Yes. So I noticed that your students with disabilities went up between 14 and 15 percent, and I'm wondering if you can attribute that to anything. You know, I think it's just the students. Um, a, a few students have moved into the district with um, disabilities and, and things like that. And the programs that we run on campus, we have every program. So um, it's just included a few more students. Um, into the programs that we have. Darn, I was going to try and get through this without her coming up. <laughs> so um, as a reminder as well, we did contract with um, ESS who came out and we did bring back some of our students that were in non-public schools. That program is housed at Gilroy High School as well, which has increased their numbers. Thank you. Um, sorry, I do have a question. Okay, Trustee Nelson. Can you explain more about the... Uh, the text grading for equity and what that looks like? So the grading for equity, um, I'm not all the way through the book. Um, I've heard a lot about it. But for us as a school, when we look at the students individually, does our assessment, um, do our assessment practices um, legitimately evaluate the student performance and the student mastery of concepts? And it's, it's, a, it's a big discussion that we have to have but you know, for for me and for us, we're looking at um, you know, can we say the student is successful if they you know don't do all of the work um, when they go home? They don't have 
some of the resources that other students have. Um, so we're just looking at how we grade and the, the system that we use. Does it set kids up for failure? Does it set kids up for success? What I've asked the teachers to do is instead of setting <clears throat> the bottom of their grading um, scale to zero is to um, set it at 50%. Um, because if a student gets behind and has 23%, um, they're never gonna be able to write, rise it up or, or make the progress to even get a D. It's just the, the gap is way too much. But if they set it at 50% and a student all of a sudden has, you know, a vision um, one night that he wants to, or he or she wants to complete assignments and get back on track, they can be able, moving from a 50% or whatever um, up is much easier and more attainable. Um, so, you know, it's not, all of our staff hasn't done that and they haven't um, um, agreed with that. So we're just having that discussion. And one of the biggest things for the teachers is, you know, what about the student who does nothing? And, you know, whether they get 8% or 51%, they still failed the, the class. But again, we have students who, who've realized their mistakes, you know, maybe progress report, they realize, hey, you know, I, I got to get it in gear. But when they're sitting at 17% or 23%, they'll never make it. And then they have to, they fail at the quarter or semester, then they have to repeat the class. And we're just trying to find ways um, to, to motive, first motivate them and to um, get them successful through the assessments. I'd like some more information on that down the road, because uh, I can see where that would be controversial with the staff. And Ed Coates says the teacher yeah. makes the grade. Absolutely. And we've, from the very start, we said, you are responsible for the grades. We're not telling you how to grade. We're not telling you what to give. All I want them to think to do is think about it. Think about it. That's all. And since I have Mrs. Hack on my campus, she keeps me in line too. <laughs> Any other questions or comments, trustees? Trustee Diaz. Uh, I'll just make a comment again, but... Uh... I do want to commend you on the focus on uh, inclusivity. I think the, having it be one of the top three things that you guys are focused on. I'm looking at the subgroup data and um, just reiterating it for people out there watching that English learners are one, one out of five, you know, approximately. Uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged, one out of four almost. And students with disabilities, 15%, one out of nine or so, uh, let alone those students that have multiple uh, into that fall into different subgroup data as well. So uh, again, I want to commend you for that. Thank you. And I, I got to add that our leadership students last week, you know, we have, um, like Dr. Padilla said, we have many um, different programs on our campus, but um, the leadership students, um, Mrs. Hack was going to go, okay, you need to go visit these two uh, you know, self-contained classrooms, the leadership students already did. They did it on their own and they're involving our students with disabilities and everybody on campus. So it was very good to see. Yeah, and it doesn't escape me that uh, the mission statement, the first word that's mentioned is a safe environment. And that's really important for uh, for the, the complete student to, to show up. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Well, Principal Kapku, you're done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to both principals tonight. Really appreciate it. These presentations take a lot of time and effort, and in the beginning of school in particular, I really appreciate the time and effort you all put into it. So thank you. We will take a five-minute break before our meeting starts at 7 p.m. I was just going to push you really hard on the way. I thought that was great. So, <laughs> it was my whatever. I would have taken out that whole sign there. There was a reason why I wore it right.
Samantha, no hay nadie. And this meeting is being recorded or broadcasted. Images and sounds may be captured of those attending the meeting. We will start with our Pledge of Allegiance. Who is volunteering tonight to do our Pledge of Allegiance? Actually, I will do it. Please stand. Ready, begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I sure hope we get our student rep here soon. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, we have uh, 4A, approval of the agenda and action, I'm sorry, action item 7C is being removed from the agenda. With that modification, I will move to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And we have um, pink cards, but we don't have general comments. These are all regarding item 7A, I believe, on our agenda. So these will be held for that agenda item. And report of action taken in closed session. Mm -hmm. Hang on, I have it. <laughs> we did do something in closed session. The board approved an agreement to settle OAH case 2022-07-0047. The, no, the motion passed six to zero with trustees Diaz, Fiat, Good, Nelson, Pace, and Pisano voting yes, and trustee Aguirre absent. And now we go to item five, superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, as I often do, I talk about a hot topic no pun intended. We have been hot in the district and all over the district, we have had air conditioning problems, as you can imagine, with them running around the clock. And I just wanted everyone to know what our procedure is. So the uh, principal at the school uh, texts or emails me and Alvaro and uh, we get, a, get on it immediately. Um, that getting on it could mean our own two HVAC guys go out and service the problem uh, air, uh, HVAC unit. And in addition to that, we've hired uh, Val's Plumbing, who have helped us do, remember, our big uh, project with all 1,200 HVACs, HVACs in the district. And they're great. So they're also going out. And obviously, they can't service everything that might happen in a given day. So what I've directed principals to do is if the air conditioning isn't working, that classroom needs to be moved. They need to be moved to an area that does have air conditioning, even if it means moving to the library. But in this kind of intense heat, for the safety of our students and staff comes first. So some people have unfortunately been inconvenienced by having to move to a location that may not be as ideal as the classroom, but again, the safety of our students comes first. And our two guys and uh, Val's is just doing an amazing job, just going from school to school, fixing them as quickly as they can. To put it into context, is it like a whole school goes down or is it like a classroom? One school went down, our brand new South Valley phase one went down. Tuesday morning. It, and it, it turned out it was one uh, building that was causing the breaker to go to go off for the whole school. That's since been repaired and, and it's going to be back completely online. But that that building had four classrooms. Those four classrooms were moved to other places in the building. The whole school was down just for very brief periods of time and the Flint got right on it. So that's the only place where we had an entire building, but the power outage was before school even started that morning. And then it went out briefly, twice that day, I believe. Um, the rest of it is just, you know, three classrooms at this school, four classrooms at that school, one classroom. I mean, it's all over the district. The age of the building doesn't even seem relevant. It's just, they go out for whatever reason. So um, I, I 
Alvaro could probably comment better, but I think we're in pretty good shape. I think we've reached a lot of them at this point. Of course, the temperatures are going down on Saturday, but we'll take it. Um, so as far as my calendar the last two weeks, the, I just, I'll highlight just a few things. Um, Ms. Paceno and I were uh, able to attend a, a, a ceremony or welcome to the Gavlin campus for the new president, Dr. Avila, and his family were there and many, many other people. This was hosted by the Latino Family Fund in, uh, at the Granada Theater in Morgan Hill. It was a very nice event. We learned a lot about him. Uh, he had some of his mentors there. He's in the center, of course. So um, that was a really nice event. On September 1st and 2nd, but I wasn't able to go in the 2nd because of district uh, happenings. So I stayed here on the 2nd, but on the 1st, I went to the annual superintendent's retreat in Santa Cruz. It was 85 there, amazingly. But um, we had a very inspiring speaker. If I can get him someday to come speak to the district. I didn't write his name down, but <laughs> I will tell you the name of my Sunday report. That's yeah, he was great. And I, I so will, I can't, great. you know, I have a name issue, but I'll get you the name, but just an amazing uh, speaker. And then we did a lot of uh, work groups, which is, uh, it's one of the few times all year I get to talk to people that do the same job I do. And it was really I thought great, great collaboration, learned what other people are doing, like on principal evaluations. That was one of the topics. So it was really helpful. We, the re main reason I stayed on the second was we had a, a facility subcommittee meeting, our monthly meeting, and there were some topics that were really timely and important, like the Gilroy High <coughs> XY wing bathrooms that don't work. And that has got to be fixed. That's, you know, one of our newest buildings and it's a big, big issue. The three board members right here are on that committee. And so I chose to be at that meeting because there were a number of items that we needed to address. Yesterday, I finally met with the student board reps. I've just been so busy these first few weeks of school. Had a really good orientation. Ms. Hack was there along with the other advisors from the other three high schools. Uh, three of the four student board reps were there. I did my usual orientation with help from the adults in the room uh, who prompted me on some questions I don't always cover. It was great. I think it was probably one of our more informative sessions. And the first one will be here. I believe it's Gekka. Yeah, we'll be here at the next board meeting. Tomorrow I'll be doing my next scheduled uh, parent staff letter. We had two site visits, as I mentioned earlier in the study session, Ms. Nelson and Ms. Pacino attended those uh, site visits with me at Gilroy High and Christopher High. And the difference between last year and this year is just really amazing. Um, you know, a year ago, students were getting used to being back on a high school campus. Some had never been on a high school campus. They had been in distance learning for two years. So it, the, the climate at uh, both campuses was, was just really reassuring and really good. And uh, the kinds of things that Mr. Good and I saw last year, not even, not even an issue now. So I have two upcoming fall site visits. Uh, now I'm going to be visiting elementary schools. I've just finished the four high schools. So Glenview and Los Animas are coming up. And if you want to, Ms. Nelson's already saying she wants to come. If you want to join me, let me know. You're always welcome to learn a lot going on site visits. And there's a bunch of things coming up on the screen. Oh, I should mention Saturday. Thank you, Melanie. Saturday, we are doing an open house at the South Valley Middle School campus. We've completed phase one, which are all the classrooms. We've torn down all the old buildings and have started phase two. And, and uh, at Ms. Pacino's uh, request and suggestion, we are having an open house for the general community. So anyone that wants to come see the new building, which is incredible, uh, and this is phase one again, the class classrooms, you're welcome to join us anytime between 10 and 12 on Saturday. And a great resource fair is coming up next week, organized by Ms. Corona um, <coughs> with, with is it up to 16, 
Good evening. We have up to 20 now. 20 now. Uh, Community-based organizations and then probably eight district departments represented as well. So it's a, a great opportunity for parents to come learn almost anything they need to know about the district and resources outside of the districts. What time? It is on Wednesday at what time? Five to eight. And then we have, we mentioned earlier, Mock the Rock, but that's the way it's off. You'll hear more about it. Rock the Mock. You'll hear more about it down the road. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item six, and we're going to go to six E, which is approval of the consolidated application reporting system, consolidated app for funding category, funding categorical aid program, spring phase one. And that's up for discussion first before we look at the entire consent agenda. Trustee Nelson, you had some questions on it? Thank you, Mike. Yep, got it. Okay. Okay. My question was the Title III immigrant funds was marked no, and I did get a response from you. Thank you. But could you expand upon that? It sounds like we're eligible for a little under ten thousand, but we're not applying for the ten thousand. That's correct. Yes. Why? Why is that? So the. Um, that, as you know, federal funds are very restricted and they go in sort of a hierarchy. So at the top, we would find migrant funds and Title III funds. And this is a subset of Title III funds. So we, we the district receives um, migrant funds for identified migrant students and then Title III funds, which have to do with serving English learner funds. So immigrant students are defined by students who are between the ages of three and 21. They have to be born outside of the United States and be um, in school for less than three years. Um, in our district, that percentage of students could be quite small, um, depending on the year, um, but it could be um, up to 200 students, or 100 students, um, and those, uh, the requirements or the stipulation for these funds is how they're allocated is very similar, in fact, quite the same to other funding sources, including the larger Title III grant and migrant funds. So what is designed for is to provide support services to immigrant students. But having said that, you have to recognize that immigrant students, not all immigrant students may need the support services just because a student is born outside the United States. Uh, many of them are English learners, but not all of them are, are English learners. Also, the K-3 group is largely represented in this group because by nature of their entering schooling, they're three years or less, right? So any student, let's say born in Mexico, um, but then entering our school system that is st has still not reached the third grade is now um, considered the immigrant student. So all services that are under this uh, subgrant would be like tutoring services, um, family literacy workshops, and you could spend it on personnel, but our amount would be under $10,000. So of course that's challenging to spend it on personnel. So our approach is that we always start with the most restrictive funds to spend them first, because there are actually penalties for not spending funds. So you wanna make sure that you um, address the needs of the students. And so these students needs will be addressed, are addressed, because they're under other categories, the primarily under Title III funds. So what are those needs? They're learning English if they're English learners. So we support them in learning English with tutoring, support, ELD instruction, strategies, extra, extra materials, and the like. So sim similarly for migrant, we have to have um, certain services to serve those families and students, and they are the same, literacy, um, extra uh, tutoring, right, and um, uh, supplementary materials. So all of these are supplemental to the core program. And again, we have not chosen in, in the time I've been here, 13 years, um, to actually access those funds. Uh, we could apply for those funds. We need, we would need to uh, write them into the plan, the federal and addendum plan, and we would make, need to make sure that we expend the funds because, again, then we have to explain why we weren't able to explain the to uh, expend the funds. But as I say, we start at the top and we work our way down, um, and we provide an explanation. For example, this year with Title III, 
actually the last two years, we were not able to use all of our Title III funds. Why? Because of lack of personnel, or in, in, in some cases we um, uh, moved personnel and they weren't able to fill the positions that we had. For example, our secondary EL coach. This year we do have that position, so we're, we are using the funds, but um, we are in danger of losing or having funds reduced when we don't utilize what's been allocated to us. Trustee Nelson, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, by, yeah, I, I don't wanna lose it, but thank you for that. Um, and, and that's gonna be my focus this year is parental involvement. So I, I wanna, really wanna see how, how this works in the district. I know <clears throat> parents get involved in the elementary schools and then it declines significantly. Yeah, certain, certain parents get involved at the elementary level. Certain, but then, but then I was looking Not at- all parents are getting in. Right, I looked at uh, one school and, you know, a very active parent club and I compared it to another school and it didn't seem like academics were the focus. You know, they'll, they'll participate in other ways, but not academically. So, you know, I'm thinking like a family reading night, um, snacks, you know, mm -hmm. so- We do provide those and we provide those in our migrant program. We provide those with our Title III funds and also our LCAP, as you know, has parent involvement goals. And we use Title I parent involvement funds, which is another requirement where you heard about that at the last board meeting. Right. And I, so I we access all of those, right? Yeah. And they're all, what's happening is we're targeting the same group of, of students right. with all of these funding sources. So we have to kind of balance that out. But those services are provided, you know, ultimately that's what's important, right? This are the students and families getting the services. And they are. Okay. I'm not done with it, but okay for now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's okay. It's only September. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Approval, okay. approval of items 6A through 6F. Thank you. Do I have a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed. Now we have item 7A to which we have four people who would, four, three people who would like to make comments. So the first one is Scott Solomonson, Solomonson, I pronouncing that right? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And um, reminder, you have three minutes and Trustee Pace will be our timekeeper. I brought my own timekeeper. So well, that's okay. It's our meeting, so we'll run ours. Me, that's uh, good. <laughs> we got two of them, so we've got it covered. Right. Uh, thank you. I uh, actually wanted to thank you uh, for the efforts in raising the uh, issue with the Iowa homeless uh, to the appropriate levels. It looks like it's an agenda meeting for um, the city council meeting next week. So I hope to see some positive next steps there. Uh, I'm encouraged that this discussion is, is having, taking place um, around the COVID policy. This policy was established a long time ago and uh, it's a moving target. And we all know how difficult those are to hit. Um, much of my questions were around when it's going to be reevaluated and discussed. Um, it was almost outdated by the time it went into place because the uh, variants moving around at the time that we've had to deal with, we all know now that the uh, vaccinations required by the policy have no effect on them, which is why the statements around the cases and things like that are mostly irrelevant. So I'm, I'm glad to see it um, brought up again. The... Um, I guess that's really all I wanted to say. I'd, I'd like to uh, maybe hear, hear the presentation and then comment again afterwards, if that's possible. No. No. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Monica Pierzoli. Good evening. Um, I'm wanted to. I'm here tonight because I wanted to put a face to um, someone who has been greatly affected by policy 411946. I am unvaccinated. Um, I ab have abided by the mask. In fact, if you don't know, I'm having to wear a mask tonight as are my colleagues to this mandated that we need to wear a mask at all times on district, district property, including in our classrooms at five o'clock at night, and no one is, is present. So I sent a letter today to you all requesting an appeal my religious exemption was denied by Mr. Winslow yesterday, uh, less than 24 hours after our inter interactive meeting. Uh, I'm writing a letter to request an appeal hearing, hearing from my denied religious exemption from Paul Winslow. I feel the denial 
is an attack on my character and insults me as a dishonest, insinuates I am a dishonest person. He stated in the denial explanation that your, meaning my responses, made clear that you made a personal choice, not a religious one, not to take the COVID-19 vaccine. Accordingly, I have not been able to verify any sincerely held religious beliefs that prevents you from getting vaccinated. Your request for exemption is denied. Religious beliefs are personal beliefs and choices. I did state that I'm not opposed to anyone getting the vaccine as that is their personal choice, be it religious, political, or scientific. Their reasons are theirs and not my concern. He considered my answers vague with my request containing vague references. I did have a temporary medical exemption that expired at the end of August. He stated, although you have known many months that a religious exemption from the vaccination required was available, you did not file an application for the religious exemption till July 25th, 2022 long after the deadline for obtaining the vaccination had expired and before your temporary medical exemption had expired. He did not ask me in the interview why I submitted a religious exemption before my medical exemption expired. I had been under my primary care physicians for five months as I had horrible COVID with pneumonia and hospitalized in January and was dealing with long COVID symptoms. Through daily prayer and meditation, I knew I needed to listen to God and his own plan of protection for me. At that time, I realized that what I needed was a medical exemption, not a medical exemption, it was truly a religious exemption, which I did due to my faith. I checked to make sure he had received it after a week when I had not heard back from him, he responded he did and he would get back to me when school started. The interview was 9-6. During this time, I followed the exemption of a constant mask and continued to do, do so, along with weekly testing. By the way, last year, two of my tests were lost. One of my tests, he specifically said to me in an email, doesn't matter what the results are as long as we know you tested. By the way, they're all negative. I can understand the denial of the accommodations are a burden. I can do not understand the denial if the accommodations are a burden on the district, but they are not. And many others have them, as do my colleagues. I strongly feel I'm being treated unfairly and possibly even being retaliated against due to my letter to the Board of Education, which you all got in the spring, and my letter to Michelle Nelson questioning this mask mandate. These letters were asked for clarification. You asked, could wrap it up, please. Thank you. I will. I'll skip. Uh, those letters were in regard to clarification. I would love to meet with any of you at any time who you do not know me personally. I do know quite a few of you very personally. My years of service, dedication, and devotion to Gary Unified District has been my entire life. In fact, 41 years. I did my student teaching at Rucker School in 1981, and I've been here ever since. Um, being denied a re religious exemption because one person doesn't believe I am being honest is completely wrong. Next speaker is Shauna Marino. Thank you, everybody. Tonight I speak on behalf of staff who've lost their jobs, on staff who've received the vaccine reluctantly, but to save their jobs, on behalf of staff who still may lose their jobs. I also speak on behalf of families where parents want to volunteer, me, in the classroom, and children who have no voice. Thank you, Superintendent Flores. I appreciate your time tonight, and I truly appreciate all the time that you guys put into the district. I'm speaking on behalf of Policy 4119, put into place nearly a year ago, which was already pointed out. In a nutshell, it reads, Gilroy Unified School District has adopted this policy to require individuals who perform in-person work for the district to be vaccinated against COVID-19. It is based upon guidance provided by the CDC and federal and state and local health authorities. This policy is considered to be evidence to date regarding the safety and effectiveness. At this time, it was put into place. I completely understand the board and they were diligent following, following protocol and the best available recommend, recommendations by those jurisdictions. My question begs to the board of this. Now that the recommendations from those authorities have changed, when is the board going to update their policy to reflect, reflect the new guidelines? If the board is not planning on updating their policy to reflect the new guidelines, what persons, agencies, or medical advisors are we adhering by to make our decisions for the district. On July 1st, the CDPH changed its recommendations for guidance on K through 12. And on August 11th, another updated policy by the CDC. Now, the CDC has removed distinction between vaccinated and unvaccinated. And we all know that it's a fact, even President Biden got COVID. It doesn't matter if you've been vaccinated or not. There's no distinction. The CDC arrived with this conclusion with time and data. 
So this begs once again, when will we update our policy? I like to speak from a logical perspective. Let's all ponder. Let's, let's, let's make some storytelling. Why is a non-vaccinated parent allowed on campus for back to school night or an after school sporting event, for example, but not in the classroom to volunteer? It makes zero logical sense. Why are workers required to be vaccinated but students are not required? The student can surely transmit COVID just as an adult. This makes zero logical sense. Some may argue this policy is still in place because many children in our district have not been vaccinated. But if unvaccinated children are a threat, then why are they even allowed on campus at all? This makes zero logical sense. Are we going to continue to follow recommendations and comply with the federal, state, and local laws? Yes or no? We have been all along. So I would believe the answer to this question should be yes. And if it is yes, then this policy must be revised immediately. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And now we have our presentation of item 7A, COVID-19 vaccination requirement for volunteers. This is a discussion item, not an action item. Dr. Paul Winslow. Thank you, President Paseno, members of the board, Superintendent Flores. I'm here tonight to provide some information requested by the board in regards to current protocols and policies for vaccination requirements for volunteers. Um, so three main topics that we'll focus on tonight. I wanted to provide the board with an update on the current status of volunteers because that was reinstituted in March of um, the spring of last year. Talk a little bit about relevant district policy as well as relevant requirements. I'll go over those in detail. And then look at some of the challenges for unvaccinated volunteers within the scope of the two pieces of information from the prior point in the presentation. So just a quick update, volunteering is active in Gilroy. We're very excited. Unfortunately, 20, 20, uh, 2020 in spring, we all remember that all volunteers were suspended. I'm um, actually by a CDPH order. Um, the state of California actually- Dr. Winslow, CDPH. Sorry, the California Department of Public Health Thank actually you. in their guidance uh, requested district to stop volunteerism as a method of mitigation for COVID spread. Uh, in 2022, after a lot of discussion, the board did reopen volunteering uh, and all volunteers were reintroduced through a new approval process. And so as of right now, we have about 400 approved volunteers actively working, providing in-person service within the district. We have about hundred pending applications, people at different points, whether they're getting their prints, still working on some of the new training material that we have to do under law to approve volunteers. So a lot of volunteers in the system, and this was done in the period of about um, two months at the end of last year and about a month and a half this year. So we're working actively to make sure the parents can get back into the classroom and support that. For policy, um, there's a couple different policies that I'll mention and walk through um, in regards to framing the conversation for the board to have in regards to volunteers and vaccination specifically. Uh, the first one, which was mentioned earlier, Gilroy Board Policy 4119.46, which was adopted by the governing board on November 4th, 2021. Um, and I'll just read some of these quotes directly from the policy. So the Gilroy Unified School Board uh, School District has adopted this policy to require employees and all other individuals who perform in-person work for the district to be vaccinated against COVID-19. And a subsequent part, this policy applies to all full and part-time district employees, interns, volunteers, contractors, and all other individuals who perform in-person work for the district. At the moment, we have 100% of volunteers in compliance under the new protocols that we have to comply with board policy 4119.46. The next subsequent slides are actually directly from the Santa Clara County um, Department of Education, as well as Santa Clara County Public Health. And these slides were directly from a training that we recently had on August 25th um, for all districts. All districts had to participate as we reviewed active protocols and policies within not only the county, but the state of California. So these are directly from this training. And so I have the source uh, right on the bottom. And the reason why the title of this slide says, do we still need to test unvaccinated staff weekly? Um, there's gonna be a connection to the volunteers as we go into this specific order. On August 11th, 2021, California Department of Public Health made a directive and it does have the compulsion and the authority of law to all school districts 
Uh, and this includes not only private, but also public um, entities that provide public education or private education to do a couple different things. And I've provided in the board packet, the actual order from the California Department of Public Health, so you can read it. But there are three main things that all districts and all education institutions had to do when this order came out. Number one, we had to uh, make sure that all unvaccinated staff um, were required to undergo diagnostic screening um, weekly. That was, a, that was a big one. The next one is, or the number two connects to that. So we had to, number one, find out everybody's vaccination status. So that all districts and all schools had to create a database which was um, available to public health should they require it for us to see all of the vaccination status with anybody who provides in-person service to, to the school. Um, and number two was that weekly testing that was required, uh, which we currently still do for any um, staff member who might not be vaccinated. And we did all last year as well. Uh, and we brought that contract to the, the board, uh, which was approved um, to make sure that we comply specifically with this law and this order. And then number three was having plans to be able to track results. So we do have to archive and we have to um, actually put into databases all the results to make sure that we're available for audit from public health, to make sure that we comply with this order. Um, this was a big order that came from the state. Again, you have the actual order in your packet, August 11, 2021. Uh, we are still subject to that order. I wanna repeat, that does have the compulsion of law. It is a lawful order from California Department of Public Health that we are required to follow. And so what the county did in this training was to reemphasize to districts that this law is currently still in place and we are still subject to this order. Now, why does this connect to volunteers? Well, they define what a worker is in this order and this is really critical. And I'll just read this for the benefit of the board and the public. So workers by this order are defined as all paid and unpaid adults serving in school settings described in section one. Uh, workers include, but are not limited to certificated and classified staff, Nagala staff working in private school settings and volunteers who are on site. Um, so there's a little snippet of the actual order right there. Again, the entire order is in your packet um, for review, but this does, uh, it's an important piece for the board to understand and to know when you discuss this item in terms of volunteers and vaccination. Now, some of the challenges um, in terms of unvaccinated volunteers um, for the board to discuss. Number one, uh, the big one is the board policy. Board policy 4119.46, as I mentioned, directly prohibits this. Uh, number two, we would be subject under the order from the California Department of Public Health for the August 11, 2021. We would be mandated by law, again, this is a, a legal order from public health, um, for weekly testing for anybody who would fall in this category. So uh, any unvaccinated volunteer would also be subject to this order and the district as the employer and as the person of record would have to make sure that we, that we comply with that order. We have no current board policies or administrative regulations on compliance concerns, enforcement protocols, uh, if tests aren't done or their appeal processes, all of those things which as an employer we can do within the disciplinary framework um, that does not exist within any board policy or any administrative regulation to make sure that we can actually compel um, this type of item. And then the final one for the board to, to consider in terms of a challenge is that human resources, which would be me um, and would be a, a couple people in my office, we're not prepared to absorb a mass increase in testing at the moment. Um, and not only testing, but record keeping, monitoring, compliance enforcement, dispute procedures, all of those things uh, would be additional things that HR uh, would need to absorb um, if uh, we went with un unvaccinated volunteers within the two elements of not only the board policy, but the current order from the state of California. Uh, and so those are just, you know, just uh, pieces of information for the board to be aware of um, as you discuss this topic. And I'm here, the next slide, any questions that I can clarify um, or anything that you have um, to ask of me? Trustees, trustee Good. So who pays for this testing? Uh, the district would. And, and uh, who monitors compliance? The district. 
And so we pay for that. Correct. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from trustees? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Winslow. Thank you. Item 7B, revisions to board policy and administrative regulation 5145.3, non-discrimination harassment. This is an action item, Dr. Flores. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to read the rationale that I, I listed in the staff briefing just for the public. Uh, as articulated in board policies 5145.9 and 5145.3, the Board of Education of the Gilroy Unified School District is committed to providing a safe and welcoming learning environment for all students, free from intentional discrimination on the basis of any protected class. The proposal sup that we're proposing this supplemental language to the AR 5145.3, and it's designed to strengthen the efforts of the district to support LGBTQ plus students and families and reduce discrimination, harassment, and bullying of LGBTQ plus students in our district. The action supports the district LCAP goals for a positive school climate and community engagement. So if you look at the uh, proposed changes, go to the very end, and we're proposing adding section eight, additional steps to reduce discrimination in order to reduce discrimination, harassment, and bullying against LGBTQ plus youth in school and district activities, the superintendent may, and then there's four items that we've listed um, that we would be able to basically put into place if you approve this revision to our non-discrimination policy. So designate a period of time each year for recognition of LGB TQ plus contributions, people and or themes. B, direct that a rainbow LGBTQ plus pride flag be flown on one or more district flagpoles during a, a, this designated period. Three, instruct each school to recognize the designated period by flying a rainbow flag and or by displaying artwork, posters or flyers calling attention to LGBTQ plus contributions and themes and or make, and that's and or, make reading list and curricular materials available to schools and teachers on topics regarding non-discrimination against LGBTQ plus individuals. And I uh, developed this in conjunction with our legal counsel and uh, discussed it with cabinet and principals today. Trustees, any questions or comments? Trustee Good. This seems to fly in the face of longstanding district policy that we fly the California and United States flag, period. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not even an option. You're compelling schools to do this. It, that's why it's on the agenda. This is was requested by a board member to be discussed. Okay. And it is on the agenda. And right. this was our best thinking on the topic. Right, well, personally, I'm not I'm not inclined to open up Pandora's box because there'll be no end to what type of flags for what type of issues we do when we're in the business of educating children, not advocating any type of political ideals. Yeah, and uh, we, the reason we approached it this way was because this is a group in our district that suffers from bullying and discrimination, and we want to support them in every way that we can. So we approached it from this angle versus bringing a flags policy to you. Well, that appears that's what it really is. It's not. However you want to, to, however you want to caption it. Yeah. Yeah. Trustee Fia. Um, I don't think that this is a flag policy. I think the flag is an option, um, but I think it's really important. This is, uh, so the LGBTQ plus community is a protected class. Oh. So I think as an educational institution, we need to educate our students to be, uh, I think our high school principals had uh, equity, empathy, compassion, all of that is, we can't, we can't include um, policies that don't include the LGBTQ plus community if in our high schools we're promoting equity, uh, 
all of these things that we heard today, because that's just talk then, and we have to support it on a district level. So I, I love the fact that it's not, it's really not just the flag, I, it's the education component to it. And I think that um, for our community, we really need it, really to support the students and just to bring awareness. And can I just, I, I, maybe I wasn't stating it correctly, but the reason our legal counsel proposed this approach is because we're not going to have a flag policy. If we had a flag policy, anyone could bring a request to fly a flag. And this was her recommended approach. I disagree because you can call it whatever you want when you direct that a flag be flown, when you instruct that each school recognize a designated period of flying the flag, you have, this is a flag policy, call it whatever you want. But with these items in here, it's a flag policy, period. Call it anything you want, it's a flag policy. Any uh, other trustee comments? Yeah, this is Michelle. Michelle? Um, I know there was a controversy with the city council over flying the pride flag. And what they've come up with is um, there's a, you have to apply um, to to fly a particular flag. I mean, because when I first heard about the pride flag, <clears throat> you know, I thought it would be opening up a can of worms because then anybody, anybody could fly anything, even something that was, you know, advocating hatred of certain people. So, but then, then it's fine now, but then they've adopted a policy. And I think there's going to be, is the pride flag is not going to be grandfathered in. Um, so like each month, if I'm remembering correctly, um, a group can, can apply for this. And I think they had to pay for it or something. Um, and I wouldn't want to open us up to the same kind of can of worms. So they have complete control over that. Is there some way that we can? They have a flag policy. Yeah. We're not recommending a flag policy. And yeah. that policy describes everything you just said. It's in uh -huh. their policy. We reviewed it. We reviewed their policy. Okay. This is not a flag policy. I see this as an educational opportunity a flag is included in it, but that's not the main reason for this. If we take out the flag, we still have this educational opportunity to offer books, curriculum, all of that to our students. But wouldn't it be wonderful to, for our students that have been bullied in our district to go to their school or to see their flag that represents them flying you know, that that makes me feel a sense of belonging. And aren't we supposed to create a safe climate for our students? If we don't provide these opportunities, it's not safe for our LGBTQ students. It's just not. Well, I agree. I have members of my family who belong to this community, two cousins who are married. Um, one's a girl, one's a boy, and they're married. Um, so I know what this looks like when there is um, bullying. I know what it looks like when there's not, and there's complete acceptance. My only concern was, would we be would we be opening us up to anything here? Because it does say it's it's a flag. I'm I'm just because I I see the posters everywhere um, on campus. Um, and I, I read what the attorney sent, and I was going to say, I hope you all read. I, I did, but opinion where I asked this specific question. But it sounded as if we have we have control over this. Yes. And nobody can come in. No, I'm just. Is that correct? That, that, that we're not right. opening that up a can of worms. Opinion. Yeah. This, this this is, mm -hmm. you know, to um, address Trustee Good. This is the superintendent may no. direct. It doesn't say the superintendent will direct. And depending on who the superintendent is at some point, 10 years from now, they may direct. Flag, there are four items there. Flag is one. It's only 25% of it. Actually, it's 50%. B and C. Okay. Well, well but it's also artwork, posters, or flyers on C which is, and 
when we went through classrooms at both high schools, mm -hmm. there are flags that are posted, set up, pinned up in those classrooms already, many of them. That's not my, my issue. My issue is with mandated flying of flying of flags. You talk about a protected class. They are. Mm -hmm. and, and so are members of certain religious groups. And there are certain religious groups which are so extreme, they advocate hate against other protected classes. They have their own flags, too. Would you like to fly theirs because they're a protected class? I say, no, I'm not getting into politics. Leave politics at City Hall, at the Board of Supervisors. In state races, we're, our job is to educate children, not ad, to advocate particular political beliefs. And once again, I believe it's opening up Pandora's box. And I have to rely on our legal counsel's advice on that question, which is why I had her do an opinion for all of you. And I, and I have the same background in education as our legal counsel. So big deal. Yeah. Other questions or comments? I did have a clarifying. I know that within this board policy, it does state that we are providing gender neutral bathrooms. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want, because I'm not aware. Uh, so could you let me know or educate me? Are, is every school have a gender neutral bathroom and is it widely known to the student body? I can't answer that for every school, but I know schools like our new schools, we have a general gender neutral bathroom. I believe the schools at the secondary have designated a restroom for that purpose because they're, they're older campuses. Yeah. The new campuses, we can build it into the building. So I don't know, Alvaro, can you add to what I just said? I think that it is true that most campuses, but I haven't asked all of them, so I'd have to do that. I believe they have designated. Okay. I'd be happy to follow up um, and provide that information in the Sunday report. I'm not prepared to comment on that right now. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I just have a comment just that uh, this is coming about, I think, because we are, in, uh, the district is in, increasing its inclusivity uh, because this action item came as a result of, of designated, designating the month of June as LGBTQIA plus month, right? So right. you did pass that resolution. Yeah, we did pass that resolution. So that, that was already a step in, the, in that direction of increasing inclusivity, bringing up uh, visibility and uh, making people feel welcome in, in that regard. Uh, I, I do feel like uh, at least anecdotally what I've seen friends that I've known are do feel comfortable and, and accommodated at the different schools. I see the the new facilities being built, accommodating uh, gender neutral restrooms and accessibility to that and, and privacy wherever that's accommodated as well. I've seen that as well. Um, so those are the, the comments I've had as well. Any other questions or comments? I just want to say that again, this is, you know, I think it's super important. Like we're talking about cultural proficiency. This is a culture. I agree. And not everyone knows about the culture. So I think the education piece, again, is super important. I think it's much bigger than a flag. Yeah. Okay, this is an action item. Pardon? Action item. Okay. Seven B. It says action item. Right? Am I in the right thing? Yes. You're, you're right. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Seven B. Action well, item. We can discuss and then take action. <laughs> Actually, the original agenda said discussion. The updated one, whenever it was updated, says action. Right. So, okay. So, Trustee Nelson is correct. Sorry, I never saw the discussion. I only saw the action. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's action item. <laughs> Can do now that we have that. I move to approve. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Okay, motion carries five to one, one absent. And now we go to 7D renewal of contract between the Kilroy Unified School District and Bay Area Tutoring Association for Foster Youth, McKinney Vento, and Migrant Ed Program students. 
not to exceed $56,148.83, and this is an action item. Good evening, President Paceno, members of the board, and Dr. Flores. Uh, this is a renewal uh, request for um, tutoring services, uh, similar to what I was say, speaking about earlier. Uh, we, are, um, we are providing services to these groups, foster youth, McKinney Vento, and migrant students through tutoring. It's been very challenging to find um, tutoring um, in this last couple of years because they also struggle with staffing. So this is hybrid. They're both um, virtual sessions and in-person sessions. We've used this company before. Um, and we reach out to the students to provide these services to them. Questions or comments, trustees? Trustee Good. What, what is the background of these people who are gonna be providing these services? I'm sorry, what is the background? Yeah, it's, there's, there's basically one paragraph and it says they're gonna provide tutoring. Yes, so I, I don't have their particular background. I can get that information for you. Like I say, we've actually, we're lucky that we could find this service. You know, we're again um, required to provide out of school services. We had um, companies last year who actually um, didn't follow through with services. We had to end a contract with one of the tutoring agencies, but this particular one did provide for us. And so we renewed with them. So, the agreement, and you guys would know this better than me, but doesn't it cover, they have to be, uh, have fingerprint. Clear. Oh, yes, all the all contract. It's, all all it's the a district contract. Require. They have to do all of right. those things. Absolutely. Um, all the addendum materials are in there. Um, and they charge us for the services rendered. And then just to let the board know, I don't know if you realize, but Chris Norwood yes. is the one that facilitated our board retreat. He's a Milpitas board trustee. Mm -hmm. um, and he's the executive director of this organization. But but I'm wondering if like, they, they could be people who are not high school graduates providing the tutoring. And, I'm, and that's, that sounds absurd, but who knows? I, I you know, it's a, we it's a paragraph. We haven't the, the education level. We've just covered all the basic requirements for employees. But typically there's some, yes, okay. So they're breathing and, and, and they've been vaccinated and they've been fingerprinted. But do they, can they speak English? Can they, what, I mean, you know, come on. Some basics. Well, we've had. Are we do we have any experience with this organization? Yes, we this did. This is it's a renewal, renewal contract. Renewal. We used them last year. Contract. Yeah, we, so I'm we assuming we've used them. We've used them. And lots of other districts do too. Mm -hmm. by the and way. Has, has has there been any feedback on their performance, or do we have anybody other than they've hired? We've given them money before. I, from what I understand, the organization is very well respected. Yeah, a okay. lot of, a lot I mean, of the, the thing is, this yeah. came to us at the last minute. It was agendized, but we didn't have any information. On this? Yeah. It was, no, it was, the it update, the up, I'm sorry. Um, the updated version that you received was with the boxes checked because they had neglected to check the boxes and that we got the signed copy to you. But the 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 contract was this, the same contract we put in all, earlier. All I received in the agenda packet was a single piece of paper. The contract, we didn't see until tonight. No, I thought we posted was, the contract. Well, maybe it's posted, but it, it it's was not in your notebook. No, I apologize for that. It should. Okay. Yeah, but what is it is? His point, his got, point no, is you, you gave it up on the dais today. Right. Prior to today. Right. Okay. It was posted, but you're right. When we get the board members that get the packet, should get the complete packet. I realize it's only fifty six. I realize it's only $56,000, but in my world, that's still real money. Oh, um, Linda, uh, real, um, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I, I looked this organization up and I did see that it was <coughs> run by the, the guy who did our <coughs> facilitation. So I tend to look up all the organizations that we approve mm -hmm. or that are up for approval. I mean, even the dance company, I looked up, you know, YouTube, little, yeah. So anyway, can, would you find we out? can ask some follow up questions? It, it would it seemed <clears throat> like a very good organization. I guess since this is a renewal, how they do last year, right? I was just going to say, do, do we, we have? have an they they did follow through on the services, and uh, you know, our challenges is not all of our students access those services. Mm -hmm. We invite them. We you know provide the information. We contact parents. We remind. We do everything. Um, not all of them choose to do that, but we do provide this. It's is one of our requirements, and we do want to support our students. 
Do we have any um, sort of survey or questionnaire or um, evaluation of these services? I had never thought of it before. So Trustee Good brings up a good point of how do we know how they're doing? Yes. Yeah, so in the McKinney-Vento um, liaison uh, interviews, right, we ask about the services that they have received and the services that they um, need and what, so we try to match them up. Sure. I wouldn't say that, um, you know, like we would tie it directly to, we might say tutoring services, but we might not say tutoring services through this particular organization. We can certainly get more specific. Yeah, we might want to um, look at that. that. I think that would be a, a good thing moving forward to find out how these um, organizations are doing for us. In, mm -hmm. in, in the single paragraph describing their services, it says they'll have the students fill out a pre and post survey. Yeah, most. The results will be based on students' attendance in the program. So that, that is this basically what happened last year? And if so, where's the survey results? So we can get that information. I think those survey results about the students sort of self-evaluating their own growth, but we can definitely look at and see that um, and get that information for you. Yeah, that's what tough it was tough about this. If this had been posted timely with the agenda, I would have said, "Where's the beef?" Yeah, you would have asked your question. Long time ago, like you always do. So, do you want to put this off to the next meeting, and we can ask some of the questions? So we are required, again, this is part of our DSA agreement with the migrant. Remember, there are very strict requirements about providing support to students. And, and the more, I mean, we can, but then there's there's just a, a more time until they can access the services. And realistically speaking, is there another organization that would fill this need for um, us? Unfortunately, no. Like I said, we, we did have a situation last year with an organization that we terminated the contract and um, it was kind of a, a diff, it was a death of the individual who ran the organization but the, the people who tried to pick it up couldn't follow through so you know just it turned out that we just uh, both sides agreed with, that we terminated the contract but it was it, it is difficult to find tutoring services um, and we would like them in person to the extent possible so this is a, a combination Trustee Diaz. I have a question. Is the um, is the amount an increase or the same as last year, or is there any delta? I would need to look up that um, information for you. Okay. I would like to suggest that, you know, we approve this contract, but before it comes back to us, if we can get the results of the pre-post survey, that would be wonderful. Yes, we can do that. Yeah, and my question, my my I, I wouldn't hang up on that answer either. So. Okay. Um, Any other? Yeah. Trustee um, Nelson. I think I've asked for data evaluation of programs since I first started on the board. And that's some, I'm just going to keep pushing and asking, but I think that should just be a given. Every time we buy something, we have an evaluation to see how, how it worked. Thanks. I'm assuming never assume, Linda, but I'm assuming that we would have, because this is a renewal, that we would have some data on how many of our students they saw last year. How many attended, the absence record. Yes, right. yes, we can so get we that would information have for you. Out of, out of how many? I mean, telling me 100 attended when 500 were eligible also right. tells me something. Right. So could we get that information, yes. maybe not for this Sunday, but for a Sunday yeah. newsletter? Yes, and just that to would be give helpful. you some context, we have about 106 migrant students right now. Soon in October, we'll be losing up to 50. So um, we have 239 McKinney-Vento, and we have 62 foster youth. Again, if, not all students need services, so we link them up based on need. So it really is kind of um, urgent for the migrants because they'll be leaving in a month. They can't afford us to wait two weeks. We do have some migrant students that are non-mobile, right. right? And that are with us all year. Okay. Do I hear a motion to approve? I motion to approve. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Thank you. All right. Item 7E. 
increase of service agreement with Row Health for the 2022-2023 school year, an increase of $547,200, not to exceed $1,179,036. And this is an action item. Um, good evening. I'm sorry, good evening, board members and Dr. Flores. I'm bringing forth a contract uh, for virtual speech uh, uh, vacancies to be able to fill those. Um, we have used Roll Health in the past for other um, uh, services that we've needed, and they were able to provide us with a speech and language uh, pathologist um, to fill these vacancies. Um, last year, we did fill vacancies with some virtual services, and we we were successful in providing the services in this forum or this platform. Any questions, trustees? Trustee Good. Is so? Is this a district contract? The original contract that was done two months ago was is that a district contract? For Row Health. Yes. Y yes. Okay, and. What's unusual is we're not just adding people, they're they're changing clauses in the contract, uh, specifically under termination. What changes were made here? Typically, and we've asked for this in the past, whenever we have changes in a in a contract, that they be identified, redlined, highlighted. That wasn't done, so it, it's hard to tell what the changes were and why they were changed. Do we know why? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I would need to know the specific changes. Sure, so I'm sorry I'm to catch that. Yeah, I'm looking at, at amendment number one on page one under three termination. They're replacing it with new language. So why and what are the changes? I'm not sure any of us can answer that. So we may have to bring this back. And sure. this is for four speech and language therapists. Yes. We're really short, but. I know, but I mean, this is like a basic question. Mm -hmm. if, if we're adding people and raising the price of the price of the contract, that makes sense. But why are we replacing wholesale language? What's the purpose and what were the changes made? Those are pretty elementary things that we should be able to know. Uh, it's a reasonable question and mm -hmm. I would suggest we move it. I know it delays services, but that's a reasonable question. Trustee Good, specifically what area of the contract, just to reiterate so that- if, if, Yeah, you look at page one. It's, it's the bottom half of the page that's changing language. Okay. And the question is, what and why? Okay. Oh, I do. Got it? Uh, no, I don't. Sorry. Can you from, tell from me the, that again? I had to find the contract. Three, yeah. um, amendment one says we're replacing the words one. and here are the new words. It's hereby deleted and replaced its, in its entirety with the following termination and suspension provision. Okay. I got it. Got it? Okay. I Perfect. just want to make sure we know what we're looking at here. Okay, uh, for me, the what and why is the, the increase, the delta, just as why, why. For speech and language. So position. so the number of students are, oh, this is a position? These are mm -hmm. four speech and language okay. positions. Okay. That's they, why it's that amount of money, an increase. Is it is it doubling the amount of positions? Oh, we have much more than that. We we. We have still have four vacancies. Okay. We approximately have about 17 speech and language therapists that we, we need to provide our services, and we still have four vacancies. Okay. So even with these four, we will have four? No, then we will be full. We, we will, will be, be staffed. full with these four? Yes. Okay. These four make up to 17? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just to... Um, for history, when I was in HR, Sorry. I left in 07... So 15 years ago, yeah, we were short speech language therapists. We have been short for decades in the state of California. Yeah. So I'm glad, and Roe Health wasn't around then, so I'm glad that we have them. But we have issues with their contract. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'm reading as if anew, regardless of what the changes are, of what the new termination and suspension clauses are. And I don't see anything that I object to I guess something could be removed and that wouldn't be here. Yeah, and I and I don't have time. I'd have to look at it word word by word and it may be fine, but if our own personnel can't tell us why it's there and what's been done, then that's not good. I, I agree it's not good, but I worry about we need, we have students who need service. 
And if we don't provide the services, well, can we can we just well it's on for it's on for action. Can't we just authorize the extra funds and have this come back to us with an explanation? Without a contract? Yeah, without a contract. We have a contract. This is an addendum to the contract. It's, we have a contract for over six hundred thousand dollars. I don't think I don't think we're going to run out of money before the the new board meeting uh, of the six hundred thousand that was authorized two and a half months ago. Are we? Yeah, the six hundred thousand was already there for other types of services from Row Health. Yeah, like yeah. our testing, but this one references. Well, I don't know. You're an attorney. Well, yeah. Yes. And <laughs> yes. And I, and I would require from another attorney a red line document, and I would ask the question, G. Why, why is this happening? Yeah. What is, what are you doing? Okay. That's what an attorney would do. Well, if the Ms. board's willing to authorize the expenditure, then we can get the services started and we'll get this done. I have no yeah. issue with that. I mean, and I would move that we, we authorize that and then have this come back to us for formal approval for the, for the, for the addendum with the explanation. If Row Health will be willing to do that, I can't speak for them without a signed contract. Yeah. So we'll have to. Either way, we're bringing it back to you next time. On the 22nd. Yeah. Okay, so do I have a motion to approve the expenditure of um, $547,000? Um, and the addendum will be coming back to us on September 22nd. That was my motion. I guess it's not just the expenditure. It's also we want the service. We want the service. <laughs> well, true. Yeah. We're not just going to yeah. give them money. We want something <laughs> in return. <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> okay, so do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Polito. Sorry, I didn't want to jam you up, but I couldn't. No, I, I, understand. <laughs> I have to have an answer for that. Okay. Seven. I like you. F, <laughs> G, and H. Dr. Winslow. And we'll listen to all of them and then take them as a group. How's that? Sounds perfect. Thank you, President Piceno, members of the board, Superintendent Flores. Um, as you mentioned, item 7F. 7G and 7H are very similar, but I'd like to go through each one so the board knows exactly what it's approving. 7F, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> 7F is uh, Mr. Javier Alejo. Um, this is an interesting case. Mr. Alejo actually student taught with us, which is great. We're starting to see a little pipeline coming within the district. Student taught and was hired as an intern. And unfortunately, the state of California decided to change all intern requirements um, after everybody enrolled in college. So San Jose State um, and most colleges in California are scrambling to try to figure out how to make these things, uh, how to honor these contracts. And so Mr. Javier Alejo is, is fully in a credential program. He was up to two months ago, fully intern eligible with the state's change and the surprise. We do have to um, apply for a variable term waiver because he um, has not passed his CSETs yet, which were not a requirement for an intern. But now they are requirements. So the C sets are the, the standard exams that you would take as a teacher for your subject matter. Um, and so he's he's actively teaching, doing a great job. He's actually a split position between Gecka and Mount Madonna, but he was he did a student teaching with us, which is which is a great um, a great pipeline story. And item 7G is another example of a pipeline. Ms. Karen Vasquez Lopez was a student teacher with us at Rod Kelly. Um, she's fully bilingual. She does have a preliminary credential without the BCLAD authorization, which allows her to teach um, directly in Spanish, even though she's fully bilingual. So this waiver is to add the B to her CLAD, so to allow her to teach in a bilingual classroom. Again, she's student taught fully with us both semesters, taught a, she student taught at Rod Kelly, um, highly recommended by uh, the principal, and we really worked hard to recruit her into the classroom. So 7G is authorizing the addition of the B so she can teach directly in Spanish in our dual immersion program. Um, and then 7H is for Mr. Allison, and I hope I do not mispronounce his last name, Yufhenyoy, I believe that's how you pronounce it. Um, he is actually a second year teacher with us. Um, his story is uh, he is an out of state credential candidate. He was fully credentialed as an ESL teacher in Vermont, which is not recognized in California as an actual credential. You have to have a sub-credential to teach ESL in California. It's a very weird story, 
Um, but he's actively getting his credential, not only transferred, um, but also getting um, the, his, uh, he actually has a French degree because he's a native French speaker. And so his degree is in French, but in California to teach ESL, you have to have a sub degree under your degree, which is the opposite of Vermont. Uh, he's actively teaching at Gilroy High School in uh, teaching ESL with our newcomers and so forth. And his, he's actually credentialed to do that in the state of Vermont. So what this does is allows us to keep him at Gilroy High for the second year while he actively works on transferring his Vermont credential to the California criteria of credentials. And so that is item 7G, 7F, and 7H. Dr. Winslow, may we assume that these three individuals are um, either in, are preferably enrolled in whatever courses or programs that they need in order to be able to come back next year? Yes, and so we actually, this waiver, there's a component where we have to show their progress. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Javier Alejo is currently in San Jose State's program, fully anticipated to come back next year um, if everything is successful through there. Um, Ms. Ms. Uh, Vasquez Lopez has her credential. She just needs to take the subset CSET exams, and that's actually in this document. She's successfully passed one of the tests, she just has to apply for the next test and pass that. So she's fully on track as long as she passes that next test. And then Mr. Ellison, um, I won't try to pronounce his last name again, um, but Ellison, will uh, he has to take a French exam in the state of California to be able to get the French credential to add what Vermont considered to be an ESL credential. So it's a very uh, weird system, but all of them um, are on track to be able to be fully cleared and we're not anticipating a variable term waiver for them next year. Thank you. Any questions, trustees? I'll entertain a motion to um, accept items F, G, and H. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motions carried. Thank you. Okay, hey, we have item 7I, approval of resolution 222303-03, adopting an amended conflict of interest code. This is an action item. Right, and I'll just highlight, you, I'm sure you've read the staff briefing. This is a biannual no, pro, pro, process. We get a notice every couple years from the County Board of Supervisors. They're the code revising body for this. And each agency is required to list the designated positions. And as part of that biannual review, we're expected to go through the list, which we did. So we went through the list and these are the proposed changes that you would be approving if you approve the resolution. So um, you can see the in red, the positions and the numbers, the changes on the disclosure category. So I don't know if you have any questions about this. Basically, for the public, everyone on this designated list has to complete a form annually. And, and the main criteria for being on this list is if they're in a decision making role. So that's the, you can see the changes. Trustees, questions or comments? And, Trustee and, Good. And, and, and this one, this is, this has come back to us again. Mm -hmm. It was kind of jumbled up yeah. before. And oh, there were some questions. We literally, with the help of, I forgot the title of the person that helped us at the county supervisors on that end and legal counsel too, went through it and we reviewed everyone. Yeah, it looks good now. It's a little, it's, it's a little more general and makes, makes more sense the way it's written now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I will say the people that are added to this are probably aren't going to be happy. Yeah, I apologize for making you fill out a Form 700. Yes. Yeah, I've been doing Form <laughs> 700s no for decades. It's a pain in the wazoo. <laughs> okay. Move to approve. Second. Okay, this is a roll call vote. Melissa Geary. Absent. Enrique Diaz. Yes. Tony Yes. Martin yes. Good. Yes. Michelle Nelson. Yes. James Yes. Linda Yes. Motion carries. Resolution passed. Board member reports. Do we have any tonight? Sure, I'll go. Go ahead. <clears throat> so um, as Dr. Flores mentioned, I've visited some schools. I visited one on my own, which was kind of fun. 
Um, I'll be going back. It's not fun to visit with me. <laughs> I couldn't let that go. Wow. Sorry. Okay. I know. It was just different. Okay. <clears throat> and I've also been donating a bunch of supplies. I dropped off um, two tables worth and some chairs worth of supplies at Luigi and I checked yesterday and everything's gone. So went to a good cause and I'm going to check Elliot tomorrow. But this is something that we could all do as kids grow up and, you know, people become empty nesters. They could look at their supplies, you know, books and so forth um, and um, help a school. And I would like to start volunteering soon. I'm ready to go. I just want to finish a couple of projects. And that's it. Okay. Any other reports, board members? Okay. So I rolled up everything. Announcements. Next regular meeting of the board of number nine. Oh, number nine. Upcoming and new referral items. I'm back. Yes. Sorry. You didn't leave. You're still mm. here. No, I'm still here. Okay. Yes. I was wondering if the board would be open to us looking at the current dress code policy. Um, there was actually a protest at Christopher High School this week. Um, even the boys were wearing like uh, crop tops or they rolled up their shirts. And I'm just, there was actually an incident. Um, it escalated over what a girl was wearing. And if it, the incident with the dress code hadn't come up, the discipline issue wouldn't have happened. So I'm um, just wondering, is it too restrictive? Um, I, I have the, the policy here. Well, students shall not wear clothing that presents a health or safety hazard or causes a substantial disruption to the educational program. Michelle, we yes. can't discuss it. Remember, it's not on the oh, okay. I'm just, Brown uh, Act. I know. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. So anyway, I'm just wondering um, if I'm just I, giving some a little bit of background. Yeah. And but so I could do that. Okay. I could put it in an email. The and, other thing is it's not a board policy. Right. Why is it listed under board policies? Is there is there five one three two? We did approve it. Thank you very much. Cool. Yes, you're right. Nice. Okay, and it was last reviewed 12 12 2019. Oh. We had a presentation oh. on the. We had a presentation a last. We just did a new one. Yeah. Okay, then what? Spring. Okay, it has the you know the smock whatever you call it. But yeah. I'm wondering if we could no, look at it. We're discussing the item. We, and we, we can't. can't. Okay. So I'm. I'm. So gonna, you want to review it? I want to review it because I think it's. So you should send a request. I will to the executive committee <clears throat> requesting that, just like Ms. Fiak did on the okay. prior item, that it be uh, considered to be placed on the board on a board agenda in the future. Thank you. Okay. And will the updated one be posted and re replace this one that's on the website? Presumably the new one's the one not on the website? No, it's not. I just did this. Oh, okay. I just did this. Okay. It should well, be. Well, that the new one should be there. It's we've distributed it widely to the students. They know what the policy is. Okay. Uh Trustee Fiak. <laughs> um, I know that uh, Mike. Dr. Flores had mentioned that there was a committee on implementing ethnic studies. Could we get an update on the progress of that? Mm -hmm. We can do that in a Sunday report. Any other requests from trustees? Okay. Item 10, announcements. The next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held Thursday, September 22nd, 2022. Closed session will begin at like oh, five o'clock, right? The twenty second. Don't we have presentations? We yes, we do. We have three so, that night. Yeah. Closed session will begin at five o'clock, not five thirty. Which means that we'll be going back in the closed session after yeah. the board meeting. No, we'll have an hour. No, possibly. There's because three, the presentations there's will start at five thirty. So they start at five thirty. Yeah. So this says so there'll be a well. study session at six, and that's incorrect. The study session will be at five thirty, followed by the regular meeting at seven. 
The agenda will be available on the district's website by 5 p.m. on Friday, September 16th. Happy birthday, Trustee Diaz. If necessary, the board will adjourn to closed session to continue the discussion of items in section two. Okay.